If I told you that anger is more valuable than happiness, what would you say? If I said fearing something is better than wanting something, you'd probably be equally as startled, right? I get why most people would disagree. A general belief people have is that the point of life is to pursue happiness. And while I don't believe this to be completely wrong, I don't exactly agree with it either. Emotions have a practical application, there's no doubt about that. Lions, monkeys, giraffes, and even bumblebees have all been documented to showcase both positive and negative emotions. And the evolutionary origins of emotion, while not entirely clear, is commonly thought to be rooted in adaptive functioning, specifically by inducing coordinated responses. Darwin was the first to propose the universality of emotions, specifically by observing how similar facial expressions were among humans, regardless of ethnicity or cultural upbringing. And building on Darwin's theory, Paul Ekman conducted a study in 1971 to test his hypothesis out. Ekman and Fleissen showed photos of facial expressions to individuals from a pre-literate culture, and then asked them to identify the corresponding emotions. Surprisingly, their choices closely matched those of Western subjects, suggesting that certain expressions are universally linked to specific emotions, regardless of cultural background. While this doesn't definitively prove the evolutionary origins of emotion, it's a good starting point for us, because it can help us unravel the practical purpose of each emotion. Facial expressions seem to have an obvious benefit. They help us inform in a non-communicative manner. For example, the widened eyes and flared nostrils in a fearful expression helped individuals detect threats more quickly, while the wrinkled nose and mouth in a disgusted expression served to limit exposure to unpleasant odors. Emotions, too, can be thought of through the same lens. Happiness, for example, is thought to be something we experience when doing things that do or will have a positive effect on our fitness, while something like fear plays a central role in cognition and behavior that helps us adapt to different situations by inducing both psychological and physiological responses to a threat. Unlike reflexes, though, emotions are flexible and are widely considered to be just as fundamental as personality traits. But something Darwin said long ago recently caught my attention. Darwin suggested that emotional expressions might be remnants of past adaptive behaviors and probably don't serve as much of a current purpose in our societies today. While I don't completely agree, there is a kernel of truth in this statement. Emotions still serve various functions, some in the way nature intended, while others not so much, but not necessarily because they don't have use to us anymore. Instead, maybe it's because we're using them the wrong way. The adaptive lag hypothesis is the idea that our minds and bodies are more accustomed to the conditions of our ancestors than they are to the state of our world today. With the rapid advancement of technology, coupled with human innovation outpacing the slow process of selection, a gap or mismatch has emerged, as new, more beneficial traits take time to evolve. Meanwhile, older traits that were once advantageous don't hold the same benefit as they once did. And I theorize, along with Darwin, that at least to some extent, some emotions can fall into this category. So today, I wanted to put forth an argument, a theory stemming primarily by me, that emotions are still valuable, but that we're using them in the wrong way. And so to get the most out of our emotions, we have to repurpose them, so to speak, into a more effective channel. And specifically, there are four states in particular that I have in mind. Fear, anger, sadness, and curiosity. The neurobiology of fear is actually an area of study that's still in its infancy. Even so, there are a few key takeaways that are well understood. To simplify things, the root of fear stems from a region of the brain called the amygdala. Its function is to recognize signals of danger and trigger appropriate responses. Within the amygdala, the head control center is the central nucleus. It regulates fear responses by sending signals to many different regions of the brain, all of which work in tandem to either increase alertness or freeze us in fear. In addition to the amygdala, other brain regions are also involved in the fear response. The insula cortex is responsible for an increase in alertness, while the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, a prefrontal region, is associated with expressing threat learning. And it's well documented that the basic brain circuits underlying fear appear to be universal across mammals. But the way we learn about what to fear differs. In humans, social interactions play a crucial role in threat learning. As an example, children may develop fear of bacteria through warnings from parents or caregivers. 
which highlights the nuanced nature of fear learning and why studying the fear pathway in the brain is so difficult. Still, Joseph Liddell's research on fear further illuminates our understanding. He identified two brain systems involved in the fear response, both linked to the thalamus and amygdala. The older system operates swiftly and directly, transmitting sensory information rapidly to the amygdala, which triggers an autonomic motor response. In contrast, the newer system is more intricate and involves sensory processing in cortical areas of the brain before reaching the amygdala, allowing for a more comprehensive evaluation of the potential danger. Lido hypothesized that the persistence of the older, faster system offers survival advantages. And this is because of its role in activating the fight-or-flight system for quick action to potential threats, even before conscious assessment can occur. The older system is still adaptive, for obvious reasons. But the newer system, while advantageous in the case of social learning about threats, such as what foods to avoid, can also be maladaptive in other cases, such as when an imagined threat leads to an extreme anxiety disorder. And in studies on rodents, it's well documented that the basal lateral nucleus, a part of the amygdala, plays a role in storing information that ultimately leads to developing a phobia. Naturally though, this brings up a question. If humans learn about threats through social learning, but the same social learning can lead to the development of phobias, how do we use this fear as a tool in our modern environments? Well, because humans are a unique species that have the capacity of learning what to be afraid of, we can reframe fear to use it as a tool for direction. A common finding in studies on emotion and well-being highlight the tendency of fear to decrease risk-taking among participants. In a meta-analysis of studies on fear, Sean Wake and colleagues in 2020 explored how fear influences risk-taking behavior. They provided an overview on all the existing findings and systematically examined the factors that might affect this relationship. Their findings demonstrated a consistent impact of fear on risk-taking, with an average effect size suggesting that fear is associated with reduced risk-taking behavior. But in a small number of studies, fear was also linked to an increase, an increase in risk-taking behavior. Conflicting, I know. Fear decreases risk in most cases, but can increase it in a select few. So why the difference? It's because of how fear is interpreted, or more specifically, reframed. While some experiences of fear can be disorientating, especially from an observational standpoint, such as encountering a dangerous wild animal, it can also be orientating. Now by orientating, I mean a sense of resolve, a clarity, a decisiveness that can make the pursuit of an outcome more likely. Let me explain. A sense of direction or a firmness in the pursuit of a goal can be triggered by both positive and negative life events. As an example, a new relationship can spur feelings of positive momentum and make one want to be better for their significant other. At the same time, getting fired or getting bullied can spur one into a cycle of determination where change is a must. However, it's important to clarify that by the same token, each of these situations can be flipped on their head. One can get too comfortable in a relationship and start to slack off, eventually leading to a breakup, and one can also lose a job and feel defeated as a result, ending up wasting their days away in misery. The frame is the key in what spurs our actions. To return to the idea of fear being orientating, studies have shown that fear can help us consider information more carefully. A great example comes in the form of those with religious backgrounds. The fear of a deity's judgment creates a long-standing fear that structures one's life. It influences what to commit to and what actions to avoid. This is a decisive fear, and it is used to spur action, to create clarity. Likewise, this principle can apply to other contexts as well. If you have a goal, for example, it's a much better strategy to document what you're afraid of and focus on running away from it than it is to pursue something you want. In other words, the experience of fear can be generated and used as a tool with the goal of guiding us in directions we want to head. Consider propaganda for a moment. In these situations, one group of people often uses fear as a manipulative tool to disorient others, to make them behave a certain way, vote a certain way, or believe a certain thing. But what interests me most is using fear on ourselves. If our newer system of fear is used primarily for social learning, does it not make sense that we can manipulate this portion of fear in order to direct our movement? I mean, think about it for a second. The fundamental goal of fear is avoidance. It's an emotion used to guide one away from something, which means it does direct action, just not in the traditional manner people are used to. When we think about direction, we think about moving towards something we want. 
Instead, I think fear in today's environment can be just as relevant as it was in our ancestral past if we use it to direct us towards something we want by fearing what will happen if we don't pursue it. And there is a study conducted by Tamir and Ford in 2009 that showcased if individuals are pursuing an achievement-based goal, so something like getting good grades or striving for a better career, fear was a better emotion than something like desire for motivating action. Still, while fear is useful, especially when induced through the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, which remember is used for learning what to associate as a threat, it by itself is not enough because it gives us direction, but we still need to focus that direction. And this is where anger comes in. If fear is an emotional state that can be reframed as a tool, why doesn't it make sense to do the same thing with anger or aggression? In the hog dove model first introduced by John Maynard Smith, evolutionary game theory was used to describe the decision-making process of different organisms within a population, all competing for the same resources or territory or mates. It was used to identify why certain behavioral attributes persist in a population. Through this modeling, the benefits of aggression or the hawk strategy are clear. As long as certain conditions are met, such as the frequency of encounters or the value of a resource, the hawk strategy will persist in a population. Obviously, as we've changed, societies have been established, and humanity in general has undergone a significant shift. Anger as a whole is something most people try to shy away from, or are taught is bad. And honestly, while it's important to acknowledge that extreme aggression or anger is not useful, I disagree completely that we should avoid anger. I think anger can be used as a tool, just like fear, but needs to be done in a manner slightly outside of the box. In general, the consensus among researchers is that the brain areas that play a role in anger processing include the amygdala and frontal cortical areas. As an example, Scott and colleagues pointed out in 1997 that lesions in the amygdala impair the ability for us to perceive anger, as well as fear. Of course, the amygdala has many subcomponents, many of which have been shown to play different roles in the context of aggression. As an example, the basolateral nuclei, which if you remember, plays a role in the development of phobias, is a part of the amygdala that has also been shown to play a role in threat detection by Sylvia and colleagues in 2016. And another study even documented its role in reactive aggression, so defensive measures to protect oneself. Still, in this case, what is relevant to us is predatory aggression, which I'll explain why in a bit. But for right now, what you need to know is that Haller in 2018 found that the central amygdala is primarily responsible for inducing predatory aggression. Of course, the amygdala is not the sole contributor to the emotional state of anger, and the brain's different parts usually work in tandem to inspire an action. But when it comes to the cortical areas, these areas are usually used to control anger or direct it, so to speak. As an example, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex plays a key role in controlling anger, while the frontal gyrus, specifically the left anterior middle frontal gyri, plays a role in anger reduction. But the key takeaway for us is that the amygdala plays a central role in anger slash aggression. That aggression can be broken down into two different types, reactive or predatory aggression, and that the ventral medial prefrontal cortex plays a central role in controlling anger. You see, like other emotions, anger induces a physiological reaction in the body. The body increases autonomic arousal, releases adrenaline, and raises the heart rate, all in preparation for a potential life and death scenario. So before proceeding, I think it's important to point out that when I talk about utilizing emotional states as tools, I don't mean in their full capacity in the way evolution intended. Instead, I mean through applying them in different contexts. See, if the amygdala activates your fight or flight system and anger or fear results, there is not much you can do to control your actions. The older system of the fear circuit will induce an automatic response. But in thoughts about the provoking situation, specifically in the case of rumination, anger or fear will still arise, just not to the same extent. It is this state that we want to capitalize on. The rumination that occurs, thinking about an experience that made you fearful or angry. Studies on anger have found that during repeated bouts of anger rumination, it's well documented that attention narrows and becomes intensely focused. And indeed, a multitude of different studies between 1990 and the early 2000s have documented how anger can be used to focus attention. You see, anger is the resulting outcome of one of two situations. When a goal is prevented and needs to be obtained, or when a frustration arises and needs to be removed. 
And this does not necessarily have to include another human. As Lynch and colleagues in 2011 documented, people report experiencing anger during many different scenarios, even when no other people are present. This can include imaginative tasks or real-life experiences. Buss and Goldsmith in 1998 also found that when a goal is blocked in infants, such as when the infant is prevented from playing with a toy it wants to play with, the infant immediately displays anger. So together, these studies seem to suggest anger arises from some perceived challenge in obtaining a goal. But this doesn't really tell us how to use anger as a tool, as it just showcases how anger arises. Nonetheless, it can if we think a little bit outside the box. Anger is functional because it creates a readiness for action. This readiness for action is induced and maintained until the challenge is overcome, or the goal is lost. Which means while anger itself will distract you from everything else happening around you, it creates a singular like focus that can improve decision making surrounding the goal itself. As an example, in the study by Lynch I brought up earlier, it was documented that when anger is created experimentally and compared to a control group, those who had anger artificially stimulated had a sizable difference in goal-directed outcomes compared to that neutral state. Specifically, there was a moderate correlation of 51% between anger and likelihood of achieving the task. Not groundbreaking evidence by any means, but there is a correlation. A strong enough correlation that it shouldn't be ignored. But another argument for reframing anger lies in the root of anger itself. Anger lies in perceiving obstacles in the way of achievable goals, suggesting that anger should lead to increased goal achievement in challenging situations. And there have been a few studies conducted on the subject matter. For example, in one study, individuals induced to feel anger performed better in physical force activities like kicking or boxing, which suggests anger can help improve physical performance in activities like sports. Some researchers also suggest that angry expressions, such as furrowed brows, may promote visual focus on specific objects, along with the fact that correlational studies have indicated higher levels of anger are linked to increased persistence on difficult tasks, which means inducing anger can help us develop a resistance to challenging circumstances. But keep in mind that correlation doesn't imply causation. Finally, in a very recent study published by Lynch and colleagues in 2023, six studies were conducted to quantify what effect anger has on goals. And they found anger does enhance goal attainment when compared to neutral states. For example, in one of their studies, two groups of participants were faced with difficult puzzles. One group was artificially made to feel angry, while the other acted as a control group. Those that were angry not only persisted on the difficult puzzles for longer, but also succeeded in solving the puzzles more often. But this effect was only observed with challenging puzzles, not easier ones. Similarly, in study 3, the same conditions were created, but this time the goal was to complete a challenging video game. And again, anger was associated with higher scores relative to those in a neutral state. And finally, in study 4, in tasks where speed of response was critical for goal attainment, anger led to quicker reaction times and a greater desire to redo the task to improve scores. These findings, together, suggest that anger drives individuals to exert greater effort toward achieving a desired goal, particularly in situations where goal attainment is very difficult. And this is an effect that is only specific to anger. As Lynch went on to further compare anger with other emotions like sadness and amusement and desire, and found that greater effort and goal attainment were only specific to anger. When I talked about the neuroscience of anger, I differentiated between reactive and predatory aggression. In the case of using anger as a tool, predatory aggression is what's needed, as this is something that likely stems from a hunting adaptation, aiding us through a focused pursuit. But that brings us back to the point. If fear can direct movement, and anger helps us develop resolve, determination, and focus of that movement, the next step would be finding a way to strategize, to not just help us persist, which anger can do, but help us think, critically, about the best route to take to achieve our goals. Sadness is another emotion that could prove functional, specifically because of one thing its ability to induce critical thinking. I've already made a whole video on depression and analyzing its potential function from an evolutionary perspective, so I won't go into too much detail, but I do think sadness is one of those emotions that was relevant in our past and is still relevant in the same way today, unlike how we can reframe anger or fear. For example, 
There is some evidence suggesting sadness, specifically depression, can increase analytical skills to help solve social problems. As shown in a study by Paul Andrews and Thompson Jr. in 2009, depression promotes an analytical style of thought. The episodic focus-based rumination is a strong indication that at least to some extent, sadness is meant to encourage a prolonged breakdown of current problems. And while this is not always the case, there is a large body of literature that provides evidence for this. You see, studies have consistently shown that depressed individuals tend to process information more carefully and more methodically. This analytical rumination involves two key factors, problem analysis and counterfactual analysis. Problem analysis focuses on analyzing the problem, while counterfactual analysis involves regretful thoughts about past events and how to prevent them in the future. The key to promoting sustained analysis, according to the adaptive response hypothesis, lies in minimizing disruption to the process of rumination. Therefore, we need to understand why analysis is vulnerable to disruption and how depression functions to cause physiological changes in the body that support analytical rumination. It's believed that this is accomplished through working memory. Working memory is crucial for analytical tasks, as it holds the problem in an active state at top of mind. But the problem is that working memory is vulnerable to disruption from distractions, and it requires cognitive resources to be maintained. This vulnerability to distractions increases the more working memory is needed, making tasks more susceptible to interruption. So to overcome this problem, it's been hypothesized that depression alleviates the risk of disruption to working memory by putting the body in this state to prioritize thinking critically. And again, there is some evidence to back this up. A study by Gray and colleagues in 2003 explored how analytical problem solving is connected to attention using a memory task. This task involves remembering items in a sequence and then deciding if a new item matches one of the items seen before in a previous round. The researchers found that people who did better on a test, called RAPM, which measures analytical problem-solving ability, also did better at ignoring distractions while doing this memory task, which means they were better at focusing on the task even when there were distractions around. When brain scans were then conducted, it was found that the part of the brain called the left ventral lateral prefrontal cortex was especially active during this task, which means the study suggested that people who are good at analytical problem-solving also tend to have good attentional control. Taken with what we know about the vast literature on depression and how it increases analytical thinking, even in those who are not prone to this style of thought, it suggests that depression can guide critical thinking to some extent. So if we circle back to the arguments throughout this video, we know fear can be used to direct movement, anger is used to persist and focus that movement, and sadness can help us strategize on how to overcome our problems. But there's still one more key to the puzzle, curiosity. I just released a whole video dedicated to curiosity, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about it either. But in researching for that video, I stumbled upon an opinion piece by Paul J. Sylvia. It didn't make it into the video, but it was interesting enough that I still feel it needs to be talked about. He suggests curiosity is a counterweight to anxiety, and specifically that curiosity can be used to alleviate anxiety, at least to some extent. Fear of all to keep us safe, pretty straightforward. Being wary of new territory or new animals is an easy way to make sure you stay alive. He suggests then that fear motivates avoidance. And I mean, it makes sense. If you're anxious about something unfamiliar, you're likely to try and avoid it. But what would happen if we always avoided unfamiliar things? New foods, new landscapes, and new opportunities all could and often do lead to new rewards. So by always adopting the avoidance technique, we'd miss out on potentially rewarding opportunities. Many studies on motivation in humans have documented what is known as the push-pull theory. Essentially, it boils down to two sides of the same coin that have conflicting drives, push and pull. Every motivation we have, every desire, stems from either the need to obtain a certain result, which is pull, or avoid an unwanted result, which is push. They are two motivations, tied in one theory, that essentially act off of one another. Curiosity and anxiety are a good example of this. Curiosity is the desire to explore, or to uncover the unknown, and it motivates us to venture into new territories, but can potentially expose us to risks. While anxiety is the opposite, it keeps us safe, but at the cost of cultivating knowledge or experience. One of the functions of interest, then, 
is to serve as a counterweight to anxiety. Because new things can be scary, the motivational system needs a reward-based approach-orientated mechanism for overcoming anxiety and making new things appealing. Simple organisms are built more or less capable to overcome the challenges they will face. They have no need to learn, and they have inborn tendencies to guide them. But the trade-off is a behavioral flexibility. These organisms just act, and usually don't learn. Humans, on the other hand, are born ignorant, but we possess an incredible ability to learn. The trade-off for us is that we are born helpless and dependent on our caregivers for a very long period of time. But our ability to learn allows us to accumulate knowledge which can transfer into leverage to adapt to new environments. Curiosity is what gives us the hunger to learn. It is a reward-based state that ensures we will pursue learning, sometimes even just for its own sake. Which makes me think, if the motivation push-pull theory is correct, can we be curious and anxious at the same time? To be honest, I don't really know how to answer this question. But if I had to guess, the answer would be yes and no. Excitement and anxiety induce very similar physiological states, but have very different end results. So it's possible to be nervous before doing something new while also being excited. But if we reframe our excitement as a curiosity to explore, the nervousness or anxiety associated with doing something new shouldn't translate into a direct avoidance response, which is the hallmark of anxiety. Still, it seems curiosity's function is to push exploratory behavior, get us to venture into the unknown, and make us willing to take risks. In principle, it's possible for different selection pressures to shape a trait from multiple different functions. Aggression can be used to defend oneself, and it can also be used to hunt. Fear can be used to direct movement, but it can also be used to cause disorientation or avoidance. So I'm not suggesting you should deny or suppress your negative emotions. Instead, consider embracing them. Often, our emotions, especially negative ones, are trying to tell us something. Something we need to do or something we need to solve. But by acknowledging our negative emotions, maybe just in a slightly different way, we may discover how they can be harnessed to navigate the challenges in our lives. Our fear can be used to direct, anger to focus and persist, sadness for analytical reasoning, and curiosity to push us further into the unknown. But hey, that's just a theory. Until next time, cheers.